Cougar fans, it is time. Touchdown! What a grab! It's time to raise your colors, raise your voice, and join in on the raucous roundtable about your favorite team, the BYU Cougars. 20, it's time to tailgate. Cougar Tailgate, where BYU sports fandom lives. And here's your host, Lauren McClain. What's up, Cougar Nation? I'm Lauren McClain, and we're here to tailgate with you, doing what we do best, talking all things BYU Cougars. Week one of football is finally upon us in what is possibly the most anticipated season in BYU history, and it all starts with Sam Houston. For today's roundtable discussion, we have Cleon Wall. What's up, Cleon? Hey, everyone. I'm back again. <laughs> <laughs> and everyone's so guess happy who's back yeah back, back again <laughs> cleon's and, back <laughs> and if you haven't heard the voice of the cougars greg rebel greg thank you so much for coming on with us or is he king george it's <laughs> one of the two I don't hi know. lauren hi cleon <laughs> hello okay hello cougar nation with byu entering its inaugural season in the big 12 naturally ticket prices have gone up there have been some changes in how rock passes have been distributed but more importantly byu is in a power five conference so because of that Are we going to see a different environment in Lavelle Edwards Stadium this year than we have in the past? Greg, what do you think? Well, I think it will be as good as it has been because there have been some great days and nights in recent years. You think about uh, the win over Utah in 2021, the Arizona State game that season, how highly charged the atmospheres were. Uh, I even think about uh, because we had Keaton Slovis on the Kalani Show this week, we were showing highlights of the USC game back in 2019. That was a Saturday afternoon, a national TV game, and USC in town. That felt good and felt right. I think we've had some great days and nights over the years. I think what will change or will feel a little bit different is when we get into October and November and those conference games begin to mean things, that's when you'll sense a little bit of a difference. And it's been so long since BYU's had those kinds of stakes on the line in, in regular season games. But you're going to have it now in the Big 12. And in the WAC and the Mountain West, you were competing for a conference championship. Uh, now you're not only doing that, you're competing competing for uh, bigger bowl games and, and bigger bowl payouts and perhaps even eventually a playoff spot or a New Year's Six spot, much more to be on the line. And so in those one-score games on a late Saturday night in October, November, it's going to feel, I think, pretty special um, if BYU is doing what it hopes to do in the Big 12. You remember the Baylor game from even last year, and it was just electric, mm-hmm. like like nothing I'd ever experienced before. And I'm hoping that'll be game in and game out. But what do you think, Cleon? Yeah, you know, I think all the hand-wringing and teeth-gnashing and everything that goes into higher ticket prices or what's happening with the Rock, I, I think that's – that's going to fade away. I think that's that's something nice in the off season that we can talk about. But I think once the games start, I think people are just going to be like, "Hey, games are here. Let's let's go watch the game. Let's go watch the games." I mean, I I don't know about you guys, but I think some of my most memorable games. Greg's probably a little different because he's been to so many games, but but for me, some of my most memorable moments in games is being there as a student and as a fan. Mm-hmm. And it's it's fun to go as a, as part of the broadcast crew too. But I mean, as a student and fan, I, I just remember great games from when I was a student and fan. I, I rem- it, it, funny enough, just a few years ago, I think it was like 2017. It's kind of weird, but I I remember getting a whole bunch of people from my neighborhood and my ward to buy 30 tickets to the BYU Utah State game in 2018. And I remember that game for a few reasons. One of them <laughs> was that BYU lost to Utah State, 45-20. to 20. Zach Wilson takes over in the second half, and that's the last we see of Tanner Mangum. But for me, the most memorable thing was just being there with a bunch of people that I liked being with. And even though most of us were BYU fans and we were kind of bummed about it, the thing about it was is that we were there. And it was fun just to talk to them and just have fun. And even though we kind of walked out a little glum face, it was like, hey, this was still fun. We were here at the game, and it was fun to yeah. be with you. A couple things off what you just said. Uh, first of all, uh, when it comes to The Rock, uh, yes, there was some, again, uh, you know, hand-wringing, but more rock passes have flown off the shelves. than ever. Like, it, yeah. It's a hot ticket. And, and that's the thing is, uh, yes, there have been some logistical changes in the, sta- in the stadium setup and how tickets are allocated, but ultimately it's the hottest ticket, hotter than it ever has been, and, and that's and that's great news for BYU going up to uh, the P5 level. Um, interest has increased, and revenues will increase with it, and, and, and a rising 
a tide lifts all boats in that instance. Uh, Lauren mentioned the Baylor game, and then Cleon mentions going back as a as a student and a fan and and full circle moment. The first ever BYU football game I witnessed in person was against Baylor in 1984. Mm. As a student, I sat in the south end zone seats, and back in those days, your student tickets you rotated for six home games. You had six different spots in the stadium, <laughs> and I remember where spot number one was though, and it was it was halfway up in the south end zone seats in 1984, home opener against Baylor. <laughs> BYU just won at Pitt the year before. They didn't lose all season, won the national title. That was my freshman year at BYU. And for the first two seasons as a student as, as a student at BYU, every game I saw was in student tickets. And and nothing beat that. That was the way to get indoctrinated and introduced into the American collegiate experience was by being in the stadium on game days. And I think the students that want to be there are going to be there. I mean, they're all up in arms about how the rock passes are being distributed, but at the end of the day, the students that want to be the football games, the same ones that were there last year with, you know, some new ones, some freshmen are going to be there. It's going to oh, be yeah. the same students. They just and the numbers are bigger spot. now than ever. They really are. Yeah. I agree with you, Greg, that now each game means something like that it didn't necessarily in, in previous years. And I think the environment will reflect that. Fans are just ecstatic to start the season. So even Sam Houston and SUU, I think might be the most electric that we've seen Lavelle Edwards Stadium with opponents like Sam Houston and SUU, I think that might be the most surprising because I feel like with some of those home openers, Portland State being one, you know, teams like that, a lot of people maybe send their little kids or, you know, they give their tickets away to, to somebody like, oh, we don't really care about these games. We care about other games. I think that is definitely not how it's going to be this year. I think from start to finish, I think Lavelle Edwards Stadium is going to be just incredible from Sam Houston yeah. down to Oklahoma. Yeah, these these are games BYU is expected to win in weeks one and two, but it's been a long time since there's been football. And now yeah. there's a Big 12 logo on the field. And I think everyone wants to be a part of the new environment. And so, yeah, uh, while the caliber of competition may not be what it will be later in the season, there's a natural and inherent excitement for A, the season opener, and B, supporting BYU in this new era and, and getting a sense of what the stadium vibe is like um, in, in as a P5. And speaking of Sam Houston, BYU is currently favored by 20 and a half points over mm-hmm. Sam Houston. Would you be concerned if BYU didn't win by two or three touchdowns? Clean on the you know, I, I'm one of those guys that first game of the season, I kind of throw it out the window. I'm just like, eh, first game of the season. They, they don't get a preseason like the NFL. So I always kind of take that first game and say, eh, I'm not going to put too much stock into it. Uh, but then I remember 2017, you kind of mentioned it. 2017, Portland State, yeah. BYU plays Portland State. They win 20-3, to three, and I think after that game, you kind of knew the team was in a little bit of trouble. So, and by the way, they lost their next seven games, and there were some good teams in there. I mean, Greg knows all about this. No. LSU, Wisconsin, Utah, Utah State, Boise State. Those games were all in there. I, I would be worried if they don't win by more than three touchdowns. Um, I'm expecting the Cougars to make some mistakes, but... You know, you know, for their own psyche's sake, I almost think they have to win by like 24 or 28 points just to show to themselves, yes, we are a good team. And yes, we are to be reckoned with, unlike what a lot of people have prognosticated for them this year. And I just think this team has too much talent not to win this game by at least three or four scores. So I think, like all of us, we're all interested to see how the defense does the first game. I think all eyes will be on the defense and how Jay Hill coaches this game. So, yes, I would be really disappointed if they don't win by at least three touchdowns. I have to say, Greg, I really like this because I like hearing your opinion. I feel like on a lot of your shows – you're talking to other people and getting their expertise. I think this is really fun being able to hear what Greg's opinion is. So what do you think? Would you be worried if BYU doesn't win by two or three touchdowns in this first game? Yeah, and I try and go light on the opinion for a lot of <laughs> obvious reasons. I'd rather I'd rather commentate than prognosticate. Right. Uh, I've learned my lesson over time, too, in that respect. But, yeah, uh, I, yeah I, I, I'd, I'd like to see BYU cover. Yeah. Right. And and I've seen good metric sites that have BYU in that 22 to 29 point mm. metric range. Like they should win by that. Yeah. I, I think covering and getting in that 20 to 30 range would be would, would be, if not expected, um, uh, a really good first result. And and yeah, I think anything less than that might give you a little bit of cause for concern. But again, coming out of camp, you know, to game one, I'm always curious to see exactly who is full go um because camp camp bangs you up i mean it, it's four months of hard hit four weeks of hard hitting football and and sometimes you're not ready for game one because of how hard they go so i want to see who's actually president accounted for and then how quickly they 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 gel into a cohesive unit because there are a lot of new faces on both sides of the ball we think they're talented people and yeah. great additions but there's a lot of new faces and conversely uh the team byu's facing 
uh, is is putting out a new OC. It's a new offensive coordinator, and uh, yet they know what they know what his style is from his days at Virginia Tech. We're talking about Brad Cornelson now. Um, it's 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 it'll take a few plays or a series for BYU to settle in defensively to see exactly what they're looking at. And conversely, I I I I always like when you face if you're BYU if you can face a team in their first game with the new OC. Because it just seems that those first games, it just takes a while for everything yeah. to start really clicking for that team in terms of communication and how that coordinator calls the game. So I'd rather face a coordinator uh, in his first game as OC with a team than otherwise, and that's what BYU gets. Uh, A-Rod and his offensive staff, they're the well-oiled machine right now. They know yep. what they want to do. And conversely, teams know what BYU wants to do, but can you go and stop it? Jay Hill's defensive look, meantime, is a bit of a mystery. And and I, I, I'd much rather face a team... Uh, with with a new defensive coordinator, uh, that, uh, rather with a new offensive coordinator than defensive coordinator, I, th- I think that uh, Jay's defense can still be a surprise to teams in terms of what he wants to run for BYU. That would disadvantage Sam Houston a bit. Yeah, BYU could have the edge there, and I agree. Both teams are trying to work out some kinks during Game One. That's like across the country. That's kind of how Game One goes. Sam Houston is going to be hyped, though, with this being their first official game as an FBS team. They won the FCS national championship in 2020. But guys, it's it's their the last FBS win was against New Mexico twelve years ago. <laughs> and I want I want that to sink in. I I just man, BYU fans need to give them a warm welcome to Provo, but BYU players need to send them right back home with a giant L. And I, I think that that absolutely needs to happen by two or three touchdowns. I would be concerned if Jay Hill's defense allowed more than one touchdown. And I would be extremely surprised if Aaron Rodgers' offense didn't score four or more touchdowns. So I think that definitely needs to happen from my yeah. standpoint. Re- really good FCS program. They joined it in 1986, and from 1987 through last year, that's 35 years of football, they played 33 FBS opponents, went 3-30 and 30 in those games, uh, 0-14 against P5s, or teams from power conferences. And so they've never beaten a power team. BYU's now a power team. Uh, granted, they've never been an FBS program themselves, that right. they are. But they do have a good heritage. Uh, you know, they, they have two national championships, one back in that 2020 COVID season was actually played in 2021. They won it in the spring of 2021. It was that, that weird FCS spring season. They won it then. Um, they weren't eligible for the playoffs last year because of their transition, so they only played nine games and sat out a lot of players on the red shirt you could get saving them for this year. So there's a little bit of the element of the unknown as they tactically played the personnel game to get ready for this season. And they'll start They'll start heavy. They go BYU Air Force Houston, I think, in games one, two, and three. Ooh. So two Big 12 teams and then Air Force. And so they're right into it. But uh, once they settle into Conference USA, uh, I, I'd be surprised if Casey Keeler, the coach of Sam Houston, doesn't have this team uh, playing at a good Conference USA level within a couple seasons. I, I will say this about their team. They are so excited. I got to go down and talk to a few of the players down in Huntsville, and they are so excited. These guys, most of them said, you know, I wasn't even considered by an FBS program, or I the only programs that considered me wanted me to walk on. And so they are so excited to be able to play at the FBS level. And the guys that sat out, they would play – they played like the three or four games that they could last year, yeah. and then they redshirted the rest of the season because they want to play a full FBS schedule. So these guys are so pumped to be able to play this season as FBS members and to be yeah. considered FBS athletes. And a too. lot of these guys were national champ, like they were on the yeah. national yeah. title team. So they've got a real element of pride working for them as well. Yeah. I hope that they have some guys left come game four because BYU knows what it's like to play a very top heavy schedule like that. And then by the middle of the season, you're like, where's our starters? Yeah. They're all hurt. They're gone. <laughs> so hopefully that doesn't happen to Sam Houston for their sake. We're going to take a quick break, but coming up, we'll talk about our favorite thing about game day at Lavelle Edwards Stadium and the number one thing we want to see from the Cougars in game one. This is Cougar Tailgate. Welcome back to Cougar Tailgate. I'm Lauren McLean. Here with me is Cleon Wall and Greg Rebell. Guys, it's been over 280 days since we've seen the Cougars play at home in Lavelle Edwards Stadium. There's something about the feeling of game days. The butterflies, the anticipation, the hope, the chatter of the fans, the tailgating. Greg, let's start with you. What's your favorite thing about game days at Lavelle Edwards Stadium? The drive in from home and then the view once I get there. Uh, I've never mm-hmm. taken for granted the view from the press box, my broadcast booth on the third floor at Lavelle Edwards Stadium. Uh, broadcasters who come for the first time are just blown away, and I've never quite ceased to 
to be blown away. I, I, I just the, the view is staggering to me, and it's, uh, it's inspiring. And then I have a routine on my drive-in, and I really like that time, that half hour uh, where I can listen to games as I'm driving in, uh, do some memorization drills in my head as I'm doing all that, and just enjoy the solitude and, and, uh, and mentally get ready for what's to come when I get to the stadium. I wish I had a brain like yours. I don't know if you do. <laughs> there's, there's a lot going on up there. <laughs> I don't know if you do. Let's just say when it comes to memorization and remembering so many dates and numbers, that would be incredible. What about for you, Cleon? What's your favorite part? I, I, I think it's just, you know, as a fan, it's being around family, friends, just sitting around them and just enjoying the game. I, I, I would also have to say... I, you know, when I finally became a student here, it was fun when I got to show up early enough to the game. There were some games that I showed up like right as kickoff was happening, but I remember showing up to the game. I actually, I loved watching the marching band just march onto the field. I loved hearing them playing when the Saints go marching in. I, I just love the atmosphere of being there and then watching the team run out onto the field and being excited. Probably the thing I love the most is just being around great people and talking football and having fun, you know, just joking around, uh, talking about what's happening with the Cougars right now. And even whether they win or lose, maybe you walk out a little, you're grumbling a little bit or you're happy. It's just fun to talk about it on the way out. And then, uh, but just being there with people. I just like being there with friends and family and just, except for my daughter. I don't like being there with my daughter. (laughs) She hates football. So, I mean, it's just a miserable experience. So she'll probably hear this and say, yeah, I I love you too, Dad. I uh, (laughs) hope she's not listening to this. I love football except with my daughter. Moving on. (laughs) My favorite part of game day is the anticipation leading up to the game. The score is still 0-0, so everyone's really happy, really jazzed. Anything can happen. And I used to love being on the field when I was a sideline reporter, watching the team run out of the tunnel for the first time while the crowd just goes insane. To have that sort of perspective is really unique to be able to almost have the same perspective as the team and the coaches coming out, to be able to look up at the stadium and see all the fans and all that noise raining down on this team, you almost get a little touch of what they must be feeling running out on the field of Velador Stadium. And I love watching Kalani Satake specifically run out because he's an incredibly humble human being. And every time I've seen him come out, it's the same thing. He almost gets a little emotional coming out on the field with the gratitude of of how he feels – with everyone there watching his team and being being able to be the head coach of this team that he he always mentions he he was a fan first. And so I can't imagine how he feels coming out. I just love I love watching that. I love the the sound, the lights, I love the smell, I love everything about it. I love I, kickoff. <laughs> I really do. Like uh, the actual just kickoff like Yeah, the kickoff I, like itself. the moment, the moment because I I I I heavily script my pregame. So a lot of things are structured, but then once the run up comes and the kick and the ball's in the air, the script's out the window, and now it's just you're gonna you're gonna ad lib yeah. the next three and a half hours based on what you see and call. I just love that moment when uh, the ball's in the air, and I know that all right, we're unscripted here. We, who knows what's about to happen? Yeah. You know, who knows what these next three hours right. are gonna be like? Uh, who knows what my voice is gonna do over the next three hours? You know, it, it's it's I love that <laughs> anticipation, that excitement of going. It's on. You know, here we go. It, you, it, I've never lost that that excitement. You've had some iconic moments too on the radio. Nebra- some, Nebraska some is what calls. comes to mind. Yeah, for me. there's some some moments that. Oh, we're I love it! I love it! <laughs> and you have a new sidekick this year in Hans Olsen. How how have you guys kind of tried to gel with each other before this this home opener? Well, uh, we uh, we're just we're this interview when it's being recorded uh, is coming just a little while after Hans and I were together. We were together this afternoon. Uh, just. Uh, together watching football and uh, we have known each other for a long long time I first met him when he was a player here at BYU many 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 years ago and so knew him as a player uh, would cross paths over the years uh, as he began his broadcast career Uh, we were friendly but never you know close friends but as much as we just knew each other and kind of worked in the same sphere and would see each other occasionally but uh, weren't the kind of guys that called each other up or texted each other and, and 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 but yet um, when the time came for me to, to to reach out and and talk about the possibility, uh, things began pretty quickly at that point to accelerate, and the relationship was rekindled. We spent a lot more time together since, and we'll spend a lot more time together <laughs> moving forward. And uh, I, I'm just very, very excited and thrilled that he agreed to do this, and I'm really looking forward to the years to come with hands as Cougar Nation gets to know him in a different role. They've known him as a sports talk show host yeah. in Salt Lake, covering all the teams, you know, and that means every team, BYU and the rivals. And 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 uh, so he's done a lot of things covering a lot of. Now he gets to isolate 
and and focus in on 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 weekends on his team. He was a BYU player. He's a BYU alum. He's Cougar Blue, and now he gets to be that guy on the air uh, for Cougar Nation. And I think the audience will really embrace um, his style of 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 commentary and his personality and everything he'll bring to the table. I I, I think uh, people will really love him. And I think as a broadcaster who had to go and bring in a new partner. Uh, he checked every box I could I could want to check uh, from someone, and so I'm very excited for it, and can't wait to get going with him. Yes, he's a, and he's a great human being, very knowledgeable in the sport, and and I love his personality, so I'm excited yeah. to hear you guys. And, and one of the funny things about when you're around him, like we're together on like we're together in a football environment, it's so tough for him to focus on on just observe because everyone wants to come. He knows a lot of people, and people love come and chat. He's just a fun guy to chat with and yeah. hang out with. So yeah. He's a good guy. Big yeah. teddy bear. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about uh, some of our favorite game day stories. Let's start with you, Cleon. What do you remember most about what it could be when you were younger, as even in your career? Oh, younger. Let, let's go with when I was younger. When I, <laughs> I'll go. I mean, Greg talked about 1984. His first game as a freshman um, was that Baylor game. Um, one of my favorite first games was the 1996 season BYU Texas A&M. Yeah. I was a student here, and I've talked about this on Cougar Tailgate before. I was sitting in the north end zone. I'm pretty sure. I was sitting in the north end zone, and I still remember um, going away from us, KOK Alalui, catching the game-winning touchdown pass against Texas A&M, and just what a wonderful atmosphere that was, and how fun it was to be playing against a big-time opponent, and to watch BYU come out with the victory, and me being a student, I'm like, wow, it was so special. At that time, I'm like, I didn't know how special a season it would be because the year before BYU didn't go to a bowl game, and so at seven and five, yeah, exactly. At seven and five, they didn't get they didn't go to a bowl game. So for me, I'm just like, wow, this is so neat. And I wasn't even thinking of the season. All I was thinking of was this was such an awesome game. I'm so glad I was here. This is you know for people who are my age, this was their uh, BYU University of Miami moment from. Uh, back in the 90s mm-hmm. and so for me it was like this is my moment because I'm a student here and I'm just so excited I love that game and I'll always remember that game probably more than any other game I, I've been to seven and four by the way oh that's, seven that's and four, great yes. that's yes. crazy they, yeah. they didn't they didn't get a chance for the 12th game imagine a seven and four team not bowling now I was just gonna yeah. say there's so <laughs> many bowl games now <laughs> yeah Seven and four I'm puts thinking. you there. But yeah, that's that 96 season was a great memory. Yeah. Yeah. What, about, what about for you, Greg? Uh, I, I think the one I talked about was pretty was pretty memorable because it was my first ever BYU football game. But but uh, an, another one is is my favorite season opener uh, would probably have to be in 2001. That's still the record for most points scored in a season opener. BYU beat Tulane in the BCA Classic, the late August game, beat them 70 to 35, and that was my first game um, after Paul James. So I'll always have a special memory for that reason. Um, I, I had done one football game as a cameo back in 96 when Paul was recovering from heart surgery. But my first game after Paul retired was was the 2001 season opener against Tulane when BYU won 70-35. to 35. So, so can't cool. never forget that one. I yeah. love that. It's incredible. My house completely changed when BYU football started playing. I just remember my dad, I mean, you didn't talk to him. Mm-hmm. You know, you couldn't talk to your dad, <laughs> couldn't, couldn't say anything. He was watching the BYU Cougars. This, I think I've told this before, but something I'll remember, we had a Ben Cahoon that was in my ward growing up, and there was this guy who was convinced it was the Ben Cahoon that played <laughs> football for BYU. And so after every game, he would go up and be like, congratulations, you played such a great game. And this guy in my ward just went along with it. He'd be like, thank you <laughs> so much. And I don't know why. And I was such a young girl, but I was like, that is so funny. So I live really close to the real Ben Cahoon. Do you? Oh, yeah. The real, yeah. Yes. Well, the real Ben <laughs> yes. Cahoon. Please yeah. stand up. Yeah. Okay, guys, let's talk about what is the number one thing we want to see from the Cougars against Sam Houston in week one. Let's uh, start with Cleon. Ooh, number one thing I want to see. I, I think I already talked about the defense, so I'll skip over that. I think the number one thing. I'll, I'll give you two things. I'm sorry. I, I, I never. I'm always. I'm an overachiever. I can never do one. Uh, I expe- I'm expecting or hoping Keaton's, Keaton Keaton Slovis. Th- this is really a high mark, but I'm going to say complete 75 percent of his passes. Yeah, that's really high, but I think he can do it. Uh, he's got guys he can throw to, uh, whether that's. The wide receivers or the tight ends or the running back. I mean, he's got a lot of weapons out there. So I, I that's kind of what I'm hoping for. And and I, I expect to see LJ Martin get a lot of carries in this game. I'm hoping in the second half, at least. I, I'd like to see him get a lot of carries because we've heard and seen enough about him to know that he is a very dynamic player. And so that's kind of what that's kind of what I'm expecting. I, I know I they probably won't live up to my expectations, but that's kind of what I I'm expecting here in this first game. Well, someone from uh, a fan, Tim 
McTire. I don't know if you guys know him at all. But, I uh, do. I know. But, uh, I know the Tim McTire. <laughs> 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 yes. Well, he commented on our tweet and he said what he wants to see is mis- mistake-free-ish football, <laughs> an aggressive defense, and one special teams TD. What do you think of that, Greg? Well, Kelly Papinga on the coordinator's corner this year said that uh, a kickoff return is something he wants to have happen this season. Uh, I think the last kickoff return for BYU came when Coach Papinga was the special teams coordinator in his first stint. So, yeah, for the special teams to score at some point this year would be a night, whether it's game one or not. I know it's something they're thinking about. Um, I, I guess I'm looking for drive efficiency and red zone efficiency. Uh, you know, it, it. Who, who knows how many how many possessions you're going to get nowadays with the new clock yeah. rules? Uh, you're going to see fewer possessions, fewer plays. You know, if you get if you get uh, ten possessions, can you score on seven of them? Let's say uh, that that that'll be something maybe to look for uh, on Saturday. If you get ten, can you score on seven? Um, that's, that's, that's a reasonable expectation, yeah. I think. And then red zone efficiency. Uh, BYU has been one of the best, most consistent teams in college football recently, moving the football. Last year, just a bit of an outlier season in terms of red zone touchdown proficiency and red zone scoring proficiency. Now, a lot of that is down to the fact that the kicking game was actually inconsistent. Right. So when they weren't scoring touchdowns, you want to be able to count on, and they weren't, and they weren't able to count on field goals as much as they would like to. So the red zone number took a hit for that reason, which really – you know, is not so much a purely offensive number, but then beyond that, just a bit of a step back in terms of red zone touchdown efficiency. And I know that A Rod's focused on that being an area his team improves upon this season. And one factor that will help that improve is um, third and fourth and short efficiency. Again, that was a step back year for BYU as well in terms of converting those third and one, third and twos, fourth and very shorts, keeping drives alive. Let's see if those two things improve a little bit in game one and beyond because Coach Aaron Roderick uh, is already thought of as one of the best offensive brains in the game. And again, this is not a consistent problem. It's more of an outlier problem. Back to normal would see BYU scoring at a higher clip this year. Mm, I love that. I would love to see that. Most people on Twitter mentioned the defense is something is the number one thing they want to see against Sam Houston because as we mentioned before that's the thing that none of us have seen A-Rod's offense is proven Keaton Slovis is a a proven quarterback you almost just expect them to come out and do their thing with the defense you're like what are we going to get and I I think uh, that's that's also what I see the number one thing I want to see against Sam Houston is for the defense to absolutely dominate yeah from start to finish and more playmaking yes uh, there's a stat out there called havoc rate uh, it's how often you disrupt the opposing team and that is um, sacks and tfls force fumbles pass breakups and picks how often are you doing something that disrupts the other offense and and byu endeavors to be more disruptive this year uh, than they were last year make more plays on the defensive side of the ball and it's not just straight a matter of pressure or blitzing. It's a matter of just guys making plays yeah. and making more things happen defensively. Jay Hill, Greg, reminds me a little bit of Bronco Mendenhall in his mindset defensively. Is that accurate to you? Because, I mean, you you would probably know better than me. You're around them a lot. It seems like he's very dialed in on discipline and knowing your job and making guys that maybe weren't these five-star, even four-star guys play up. And, and make them better than they are. What do you think? Yeah, and, and believing in guys that were FCS-level players that can be FP, and not only FBS but P5-level players. He brought in a bunch of Weber State guys with him, too, that yeah. he thought could really be at, you know, excel at this next level. Um, Bronco was a little more maybe unconventional in terms of stack, uh, tactics and style, uh, um, but, I, I, but I think Jay is – He'll, he'll he'll come out of base. He'll come out of base defense, and he'll throw some. They won't be the most exotic looks in the world, but he'll throw other looks at you. He'll he, yeah. he won't just stay in one defense the whole game. Um, I, I really think he he sees where BYU needed to be better, and I think he's out to prove that uh, not only in game one but but beyond. And I think more than anything else, people are are wanting to see what does look different about this team. Yeah. Um, there's only so many things you can do on a football field, um, but but what will what will look different to BYU fans than they saw recently? I love it, and we're going to let Greg be exempt from this next part, but Cleon, give me your game prediction, your score prediction for Saturday against I'm, Sam Houston. I'm going to say BYU wins 42-10. to 10. I think okay. they give up a late touchdown to for, for that 10 to be there. But, yeah, I think I think they're probably going to get up by a lot, and then Kalani's going to, like, he, he realizes, you know what? we got a long season ahead. Let's, let's start pulling some guys out, see maybe some of the younger guys play. I think they win 42-10. I'm going to go with 35-3 because Ooh. I see that happening with Kalani putting in some of the second, third, fourth string guys, but I want BYU to show the depth that they desperately need. I feel like that's the key 
to being a great football team. So I want, even if these third string guys are in, I want BYU to still be dominating Sam Houston as I think they should. You both picked 32 point victories. Yes. Yeah. Greg, how do you even do See, that's what I'm saying. My well, brain, you, my brain it, doesn't even work that it, way. We ju- you just add a touchdown to either one. <laughs> yeah. And we're, we're fine. Well, Cleon, Cleon had BYU scoring and allowing one more touchdown than you. But you're like well, basically locked up. There you go. Well, that's weird. All right, guys. And that does it for us today. Thanks again to Greg Rebell and Cleon Wall for coming on the show with me. You can join Cougar Tailgate wherever you get your podcasts on Apple TuneIn, Stitcher, Spotify, or on BYUradio.org. Cougar Tailgate is a production of BYU Radio.